Dobrý večer, vážení hosté. Já jsem byl opravdu připraven vás pouze přivítat na půdě ČVUT v této krásné betlemské kapli a předat rychle slovo tomu, na jeho slova zde čekáme. Ale nakonec jsem se dozvěděl, že nikdo další vlastně by neměl mít projev, takže nebudu mít projev, ale přesto se malinko rozhovořím. Já když jsem sem šel, o čem bych mluvil, tak mě napadla taková paralela, že mám velice nepraktického bratra, který musí mít hospodyni na to, aby ho učila užívat a žít ve svém bytě. A já jsem zde chtěl přivítat architekta, který nás učí žít ve městech, prostě v jiném řádu. Je to zvláštní, je to opravdu neočekávaný, že jsme ztratili schopnost užívat naše města k tomu, aby byla příjemná pro lidi, aby, aby nám umožňovala komunik komunikaci ve městech, nejen tu pro automobily, nejen z hlediska trafik, ale i z hlediska komunikace mezi lidských vztahů, užívání si města, tak jak byly od jak živa užívány a v posledních letech jsme na to zapomněli. Možná jsme na to zapomněli i díky tomu, že v posledních letech jsme se až příliš učili od Las Vegas, Learning from Las Vegas, vzpomenu na jednu knížku mého mládí. A to asi není zrovna nejlepší město pro, pro užívání obyvatel a pro pěší zóny, pro, pro veřejný prostor a tak dále. Zároveň, když jsem zde byl uveden jako spolupořadatel, tak jsme pouze spolupořadatelé Fakulta architektury. Hlavní pořadatel je Institut plánování rozvoje města Prahy. V této souvislosti je nutno poznamenat, že Praha naštěstí leží ve velice bezpečné seismické oblasti a proto pořád bydlíme v jednom z nejkrásnějších měst Evropy. Bohužel seismicita plánování měst je u nás velmi vysoká. Připomíná mi to, protože před týdnem jsem zde uvítával japonského architekta Kumu, tak mě to připomíná, že v tomto se blížíme spíše Japonsku. A spousta plánů zde končí v Mariánském příkopu. Takže věřme, že po každém zemětřesení je třeba prostě spočítat oběti a pokračovat dál a myslet na budoucnost. Takže to samé platí o zemětřeseních ve městech i o zemětřesení plánování měst. Takže velkám, Mr. Gell. Takže děkujeme. A dnešní přednáška je v angličtině, takže jenom připomínám, že pokud chcete, tak simultánní překlad můžete si říct sluchátka venku. Because now I'd like to switch to English. I think uh, that our dear guest does not need introduction, yet uh, I'm going to try anyway. Uh, Mr. Gale is a Danish architect, an expert on public spaces and quality public spaces and, and, and life in public spaces. He's an author of numerous books. Most of them were translated into the Czech language as well, and you can buy them just outside. Uh, also, if you want a signature from Mr. Gale, Afterwards, he's willing to stay there for a while and sign all the copies that you want. One per person. No. Uh, so anyway, uh, Mr. Gale does not, doesn't need any more introduction. Without further ado, I'd like to give the, give the floor to Mr. Jan Gale. Thank you very much. And um, I'll just say, oops, I'll just say that the English I can speak, English is my second language, I can about 300 words, and the English I can speak, I'm sure that most of you can understand. Good luck. <laughs> I, will, um, I will speak this evening about how the paradigms for planning have changed and how all the cities I know of are striving to be livable cities and I'll also point out 
that a people-oriented city planning strategy is a very good way of becoming more livable in the 21st century. I will go a little bit back first and talk about that for the past 50 years we've struggled with two major problems, two major planning paradigms who have been very, very dominating. One was modernism. And actually, I start with the year 1960. That was the year when the really modernism started to take off in the big way. Before, there, before that, it was a number of ideologies and small housing areas were built, but from the time when the cities really started to expand, modernism was a religion, and everything Corbusier ever said was listened to and, and carried out. Corbusier, among other things, pointed out in this sketch that cities are bad, streets are bad, squares are bad, and what is good is freestanding buildings. He called the high-rise here the vertical garden city. And then everybody started to build new cities which looked like this one from Sweden. What really happened at that time was as if when the city planning becomes more complicated, the planners took off in aeroplanes and started to move over and organize the objects from a big height. Also, the site planners were moving around in helicopters and adjusting these, these uh, still leben, these pieces of art where you just put the various objects there and there and there. But what happened Come on now. Yeah. But what happened at that time was that the people scale, where people were in the cities, were completely overlooked. Nobody was asked to look after where people moved around, and everybody was flying around putting objects. You can see it very much in the suburbs of also in Prague here. I call this the Brasilia syndrome flying over. This Brasilia, <coughs> the new capital of Brazil, is from 1955, that was the competition. And the good thing about Brasilia is it looks wonderful from an aeroplane. It's an eagle and the, and the head of the eagle is a parliament and the buildings of Nehemiah lie wonderfully along enormous green lawns, very fine from the helicopter also. What is the problem of Brazil is that down where people are, it is shit. <clears throat> Nobody thought about that people also would, would be living in Brazil and move around and that they never had enough money to give all of them a helicopter so they really could enjoy Brazil, Brasilia. We have now, it's now since 1960, it is uh, 55 years, and we have had this um, modernism hanging around all this time. And it's interesting that at no time did people, ordinary people, really like it. All this period is full of, of uh, cartoons and other expressions of, I don't like this new way of building cities which doesn't look after people at all. And sometimes I would say that if a bunch of professional planners were given money to make something which people would not like, it could not have been done better than what most of the modernists have been doing all over the world. Have a nice time on this bench. Bring your girlfriend and sit there and think about the future. <laughs> the other big paradigm which has really dominated the past 50 years or 60 years have been the car invasion. Of course, the car is an invention from the beginning of the 20th century, but only around 1960 started the big car invasion in Europe. It started in Western Europe. It came here much later, 30 years later, but then you loved it even more than Western Europe and then 
making the cars happy became the major purpose of city planning. The car invasion started very quietly. This is Copenhagen, 1905. People are walking around on the square. It's their square. It's a city for the people. They have one car and one street car and one horse. Everything else is peaceful. The next phase, next scenery is really when the car started to come into the spaces. People were running for their lives. Where life was pushed out of the spaces and over to the sidewalks. And the third stage is this one, the, the, the pedestrian crossing in Moscow, where you really have to use your slalom ability. Car has become king. So these two paradigm of planning has been dominating. And we can start to ask what actually did we know about quality for people in 1960? Virtually nothing. Because the modernists, they started, or part of their paradigm was saying everything old, everything we know about cities for several hundred years is outdated. It's anachronistic. Now we have modern man, and for modern man, everything should be new, so nothing from the old can be used. In this operation, all the experiences from all the cities we've ever built in mankind's history were thrown out, and they had a tabula rasa, and they started to say, go and do your individual buildings on grass, and everybody would be happy. So, nothing was known. But then, from New York, just about the same time, 1961, came this strong voice of Jane Jacobs. She was a journalist. She was uh, a journalist in an architecture uh, magazine. And she had this fantastic fight with the chief planner of New York, New York Robert Moses. He wanted to make, make, make New York really nice and modern. So take down all the old stuff and build some really nice freeways across Manhattan and build high-rise along the freeways. That will save New York. Uh, unfortunately, and also he said, Greenwich Village must go, Tribeca, Tribeca must go, Soho must go, because these were redundant, old-fashioned, not modern, must go. Unfortunately, Jane Jacobs lived in Greenwich Village, and she started to look at Robert Moses and say, wonder if he knows what he is doing. And then she started to think about it and organize the citizens of Greenwich Village and New York. And they won actually over Robert Moses so that some of these freeways were not built. And she wrote this book, very famous book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. And what really she said in this book was, if we do what the modernists say, and if we do what the motorists say, we will have dead cities instead of live, lively cities. And she also said, look out of the window. Look at how people use the city and, and learn from it instead of sitting up in your studios and speculate morally, morally about what people ought to do. They, had, they ought to sit in the grass and look happy, but they must much rather like to walk in the street and see each other, whatever. Jane Jacobs. Now comes my life in a very short story. I was trained in the 50s in the School of Architecture in Copenhagen, and the major training we had was moving objects around, hanging over models, Bingo, this is a good city. Uh, we were copying this guy, he's a Swedish professor, who famously said that a good housing area is something which looks good from the freeway. Here he is, doing good housing. To me, this was the low point in city planning, and I was, I was trained in just that, and I rushed out of School of Architecture to do all these wonderful things which Corbusier has told us to do.
then I, I married a psychologist. <laughs> and, um, and suddenly in our home there was another atmosphere. All these young psychologists met the young architects and the psychologists kept saying, why are you not interested in people? Why don't they teach you anything about people in School of Architecture? Have you ever thought, why does your professors go out at four o'clock in the morning and photograph the, the architecture so that there will be no disturbing people in the foreground when they have their lectures? Have you thought about that? That was sort of um, a very strong medicine for a young man. And um, actually, as these discussions went on, we realized that between the social scientists and architecture and planning, there was a big gap that we didn't know how, what we, how the physical environment influenced the life of people. So all this about the interplay between form and life, that was thrown out by the modernist. We didn't know a thing about it. And that actually was the area I was going to work with started in, in actually 50 years ago, exactly 1966. I started in School of Architecture. Actually, what happened was I had to go back to School of Architecture for 40 more years to find out, but they forgot to tell me in the first time I was in School of Architecture. Then, actually, I, I did a number of studies and I wrote a number of books, and actually it was quite many books in this period. And um, then, after having written all these books and studied all this about how the physical form influenced people, then, of course, uh, there were so many mayors who started to say, you can criticize us, but can't you come and show us what we shall do? And then we started this company, and in just 16 years, we are now 70 people working in all parts of the world. So, my story, my life in a short version, now I'm in Prague. What is the situation now? Now we know quite a few things about how the interplay between people and physical environment is. There is now a number of studies, there are quite many studies. Actually, this has gone on for 55 years. Up in the corner is the books of Jane Jacobs, and now in, in the lower corner here is maybe the Czech version of one of my books. But a number of people have addressed this issue. We know quite a bit of things. And of course, one of the first places where this kind of knowledge was published was, of course, in the Czech Republic. And I was very happy about this. And we had a great launch in 2013 of this particular book. Um, and the Danish ambassador, he arrived in the official embassy car, uh, cargo bike, complete with the shield of Denmark and a Danish flag in the corner, Mr. Mosby. Um, this was great. And of course, Czech was one of the first. What is the story about this particular book? That was when I had been studying all this for 45 years. I was approached by a foundation who have supported, when I was in university, they supported this kind of studies very much. They say this humanistic dimension in city planning, it's very valuable. Would you need some money? And then they said, there, yeah, you can have some money here. Yeah, yeah. Do you need more? Yeah, so you can have some more. And then at this point, they came, I, I had retired from university, and then they came again and said, oh, we would like you to sit down and write down everything you know wh while you can still remember it. <laughs> and then I said, I have no time. And then they said, isn't that a matter of how many assistants we can give you? And then at some point, I had time. And we made the, we made the book. and. Which, which, of course, is supposed to have the truth, the full truth, and nothing but the truth, but that's another story. It came out in Czech very early. They, actually, the Czech people who have looked after this has been very quick in responding to what is happening. This 
little funny book is now out in all kind of funny languages. It's even out in French. Took, f <laughs> took 40 years for the first book in French. Because in France they have a very strong culture themselves. Um, so this little book was published in French in Montreal, in Quebec. <laughs> but they export it now to France. Also the book, yeah, there's a, there's a book in Iranian, I didn't know about it, but some people told me that they were using this book all over Iran. I was very happy because I always did this so that this information about people could be spread. And the more they read it in Iran, or in Arabic countries, or in, in Thailand, whatever, the more, the happier I am. So, that's Iranian. And then, oh, yeah, that's a Greek book, the Greek. The Greeks phoned and or contacted me and said, we would like to publish your book in Greek. And, and I said, no, no, no. You must have better things to use your money for. I don't think you should use your money to publish my book. That it's more important other things. But then they said, don't worry, don't worry. It's paid for by the Danish embassy. <laughs> so they have the book in Greek. In, in Czech Republic, we even have a fan club. I think it's located in Brno. And uh, here the fan club, actually it's only four people, but it's nice to have a fan club. <clears throat> What have we learned in all these years? We have first, we certainly learned that every time we build anything, we manipulate with people's opportunities, with the quality of life for people. We can say that first we shape the cities, but then the cities shape us. The cities really dictate what kind of life quality and lifestyle we can have. And we've learned quite a bit about this connection. I'll just mention one example here. To me, one of the finest public spaces in the world is a campo in Siena. It's eight, seven, eight hundred years old and it, it works perfectly. And it's really the most important thing about Siena is the, the campo, the fantastic campo. And then you can ask this fantastic public space, is this a miracle or is it common sense, and then over the years we made a list of all the important things you should look after in a good public space, and then you can take this list and go back. Yeah, the list is, on top is something about protection, in the middle is something about comfort for people, and in the bottom is something about enjoyment, it's about human scale, it's about the possibilities to enjoy the good part of the weather, the part of the weather you like, and then there is the possibility to have good sensual experiences, that is architecture, design, materials, surfaces, water, views, mountains, uh, views, and, and, and greenery, whatever, all the nice things, but they are only one in 12 of things you should look after to have a really good place for people. And if you take this list and go back to, Vienna, to, to Siena, then you find that in all these 12, not only you could say yes, but you could say, yeah, yeah, 12 times. That's why it is world famous and why it still is functioning so good. It really has all the people qualities you can dream of. Now we are in the 21st century, and I actually think that around the shift from the old century to this century, we started to see really in earnest some changes in the planning paradigm. That it was not anymore to make the cars happy and to do modernistic planning, because now we could see there was a distinct change and what mayors and people in the cities wanted now was a livable, lively, a city of quality where emphasis was not on quantity but on quality of life for people. Also we had the new challenges, the new drivers that we must make a sustainable city and a healthy city. 
the first of these um, livable and lively city has very much to do with the meeting place of people. Actually, we made the cities so that mankind, so that Homo sapiens could meet his fellow people and together they could develop the culture. The greatest interest Homo sapiens have throughout the history of the world is Homo sapiens. We are so interested in people. I found, I found an old uh, uh, story or old line in an old Icelandic saga saying, "Man is man's greatest joy." And we have, the more we have studied people, the more we have found out, of course, that the greatest attraction in a city is the people. The benches where you can see the people, they always used much, and places where there are no people they are used much less than places where there are people. And actually, man is a social animal. And we need people, we need to meet people to be inspired. We need to see from other people how life goes on, whatever. It's always been so. And now in this century where we need live more and more spread out, we have smaller and smaller households, we have longer and longer life and more and more leisure time. And even if we talk in telephone all the time, we still have a lot of time. And it's been discussed if cyberspace can substitute public space. Certainly not. Give 100 people each an iPhone and put them out in the desert of Sahara. And after a week, they will go crazy, uh, even if they have the phone. Um, so, really, we found that there's an increased, there's increased eagerness to have public spaces. And everywhere in the world where good public spaces have been made, they have become very much used. So, we like lively, livable cities. Also, we've had this new driver ever since uh, Gro Brundtland made the Brundtland Report pointing out the challenge to the climate. We know that the more we walk and bicycle, the better for the climate. But also we know that we must come up with alternatives to car transportation, uh, the more sustainable solutions. And if you ever wanted a good public transportation system, the other part of that picture is to have a good public realm so that people can walk and bicycle to the stations and to the bus stops and train stops, whatever. The third new driver is that we want a healthy city, a city which invites people to healthy lifestyles. We now have this awful problem, the sitting syndrome. Uh, my daughter is a doctor and she's told me a lot about how the doctors talk about it now, that that is one of the major challenges for mankind after smoking has been put away, then sitting syndrome. And then we realized that we as architects and planners for 50 years have done everything in city planning to make people sit in the morning, during the day and in the evening. 25% of people go to fitness centers, which is morally the right thing to do. But the 75% other people, they just sit and sit and sit. So Having fitness centers with escalators is not the solution. And that is why the World Health Organization, they now say in their action plan, make cities, for God's sake, so that you can walk and bike as much as possible in the course of your daily day doings, because that is the safest way to have people use them, their own muscles and have them exercise and Already now we know that people in cities live longer than people in suburbs. And why is that? Because in the cities you walk more and in the suburbs you drive more. And if you look at this in the big picture, then they found that actually the people in the cities they live longer. We know now that if we have one hour of moderate exercise every day, we can live as an average seven years more than longer than the guys who don't. And 
We also know that the quality of life in the old days is much better if you move during your life. And it's much the, the most cheap health plan any nation can do is to make cities so that people walk. That's the cheapest. We save a lot of money for all the people who used to go to hospitals in the old days. So this is what we have as a challenge. And if we look closer at the people, if we are sweet to the pedestrians and sweet to the bicycles maybe, then actually we address all three issues. We have a more livable, more sustainable and more healthy city. I mentioned that that the turn of the century really was uh, an important time. And I have been so surprised to see this humble little book in just actually six years is out now in 32 versions all over the world because that shows me that there is an enormous interest in a more people-oriented city planning and in addressing these questions about city quality sustainability and health for people. Also, these are the same 15 years when our company has been working and we have now worked in 200 cities from one end of the world to the other, from Greenland to New Zealand and from Japan to America. If we ask, we, a number of, of tools have been developed and they are described in, not only in my books but in a number of other works by now. What are these tools used for? Yes, really what they have been used for in recent times is to improve the existing city fabric. And we can ask, are there cities today who have this policy in this city will do everything to invite people to walk and bicycle as much as possible in the course of every day and not only the weekend. Yes, there are increasingly many cities who have such a people-oriented policy. What happens? We know what happens if you invite more traffic. If you make more streets, what happens? You have more traffic. We have known that now for 50 or more years. What happens if you're really nice to walking and to public life? Again, uh, my hometown of Copenhagen can serve as an example because they worked on this idea now for more than 50 years. The first street in Copenhagen was cleared of cars in 1962. That is 54 years ago. At that time, it was very much a pioneer work and everybody was discussing how crazy the city was to pedestrianize anything because uh, they said that we are Danes, we are not Italians. Uh, Danes will never come out of their houses, they will never promenade in the city. And furthermore, it's too cold to be outside in Scandinavia. So any idea of having people's places in Scandinavia is a dead hearing. Then they closed the street and next year we started to be Italians in Denmark. And we have become more and more Italian as years go by. Um, Copenhagen became the first city in the world where the life in the city was systematically studied. We did it in the university as research. But in all the cities in the world we have in all these years a traffic department who studied the cars every year and they had perfect statistics about the cars and whenever there was a planning or a proposal they could say we need three extra lanes here, we need extra lanes here, we need so many parking spaces. They had the traffic in there, they were very smart, they had everything organized. But no city in the world had a department for people, for pedestrians, for public life. And no city in the world had any figures and documentations about how the city was used by people. And you know that what, is, what you really plan for is what you know about. So if you know a lot about traffic and nothing about people, you plan for the traffic and you talk about being sweet to people, but you don't do anything about it. In Copenhagen, very early on, they started to have documentation 
And that very early on became part of the, what the city council and the city planners was doing. They actually looked to the university and say, can we have your newest research on Copenhagen, life in Copenhagen, so we can make a better city. When I retired from university, I got this nice letter from the mayor saying, if you guys in university had not documented how people used Copenhagen, we politicians would never have dared to make Copenhagen the most livable city in the world. Here is a little bit about, when in Copenhagen they've improved the city every day for 50 some years. This is the situation when the first main street was closed, one kilometer main street, 62. This is the same situation today, city center. All these places have been addressed and approved and are really nice for people now. Looking back, I can see clearly that there are about three or four phases in this humanization of the city. The first phase was to make it possible for people to walk and promenade. That was the years of the pedestrian street. That was way back in, from 1960 to 1980. Then came the second phase where the focus was on walking, yes, but now also on staying in the city, enjoying the city, recreation in the city. That was the, year, the years of the time when the cappuccino culture started to spread all over Europe. But that's also the time when people had more leisure time and a bit better economy. That's also the time when tourism really took off and people started to visit each other cities. And what do you do in a city? Do you walk and walk? Yeah, but you also sit and sit in a city to look at what's going on. So we had to make, in Copenhagen there were 18 squares in the old town, all 18 were full of cars, all the cars, the parked cars were going. Then maybe I just return here and tell you about a fantastic traffic engineer we have had in Copenhagen for many, many years. He's now retired, but he did a fantastic work. He was a traffic engineer who believed that a good traffic engineer is a guy who tried to reduce traffic as best he could. And he did a number of funny things. One is, he said, if they can't park, they won't drive. That's very genius, actually. And then he said, if I take 2% of the parking out of the inner city every year and don't tell it to anyone, nobody will notice. So do it slowly and don't tell about it. And actually what he managed to do was to reduce gradually over 20, 30 years the parking in Copenhagen. That means that gradually the traffic dropped down and when I was a young person we, we could just take the car and go to the city. No problem. Now my wife and I never think about it, that would be silly, uh, because it's much more easy to take the bicycle or take the metro or take the public transportation, because, uh, and there is a, something connected here, because if there are fewer parked cars and fewer, less traffic in the streets, actually the city becomes nicer. So when the traffic go down, the quality go up. So now we have a city which is much better to visit than 50, 50 years ago or 40 years ago, but it's a little bit more difficult to reach with a car, but there are many other new ways of getting there. The third phase of these public spaces are the time from now, 2000 and forward, where playing sports and activities, it's a time where all this about moving is more and more in fashion, and also the architects are more and more funny in the where public spaces and that's nice. And we started to swim in the, in the harbor and whatever. All this is part of the third wave of public spaces. Now we have all these spaces lying there side by side and we are getting more and more Italian for every year. In Copenhagen also now, they have passed in city council a policy 
saying, we will be the best city for people in the world. And, and they have a number of goals, and they check the goals every year to see what is happening. We are now into the fourth phase, where it's not about making the city center nice, but making the whole city nice. And what they are doing in Copenhagen now with all the major streets, they used to be four lanes or five lanes, asphalt, and now there are two lanes, they have a median, they have street trees, they have bicycle lanes, they have sidewalks, and the lower street is much more safe, much more beautiful, and interestingly, it can take almost the same amount of traffic as the old street could, because the traffic engineers are now much smarter than they were in the 19th 70s and 1980s. So this is what is happening. And then this is something which I really like. That is, whenever you have a small street going into a big street, they take the sidewalk and the bicycle lane across the small street. They also narrow the small street and put a bench and a tree. And I thought, gee, that's nice because that's prioritizing people on foot and people on bicycles, they are just as valuable as any guy in a Mercedes-Benz. But then I talked to my daughter and she said, oh, Papa, this new thing is so wonderful. Because now Laura, my granddaughter, seven years old, now suddenly she can walk on her own to school because she can stay on the sidewalk all the way to school instead of crossing six streets when you're seven, you don't cross six, uh, four streets on the way to school. But if you can stay on the sidewalk, then it's Mercedes-Benz who have to cross sidewalks instead of seven-year-old who have to cross streets. That's a great difference if you're seven years old. So that's humanizing a city and sort of saying that people are just as valuable as the car. We want to make people um, just as happy as we always tried to make the cars happy. What have we learned in Copenhagen in these 50 years with improvement every year, something is better than last year. We have found that we have developed a terrific culture of using the public spaces. Every time there is nice weather conditions, you can see all these various types of public spaces being invaded by people. So whenever, Whenever there is a chance, people now go out in the wonderful public spaces and walk and do whatever they can. So we've learned if you make more streets, more roads, you have more traffic. If you make more good public spaces, you have, after 10 or 20 or 30 years, more and more public life. To me, it's rather logical. If you invite this activity or this behavior, you get that. If you invite the other one, you get that. Another aspect of the Copenhagen planning is the bicycling strategy. Uh, what happens if you are sweet to the bicycles? Um, they've done that in Copenhagen now for many years, and we have now a complete city-wide network of rather good bicycle lanes, which are wide, somewhat wide, and have curb to the traffic. Over the years, there has developed quite a bit of transport system Every third family in Copenhagen have a cargo bike where they can transport their kids to activities and to around in the city. Ta -da. The crucial part of a bicycle system is the street crossings. Again, that has been studied and they've come up with a number of things which make the street crossings safe. If you are 10 years in Copenhagen, you are allowed to bike from one end of the city to the other, because bicycling is safe for 10 years even. To have a good bicycle system, it has to be integrated with the public transportation system. In Copenhagen, you can take your bicycle in all the trains for free, and you can take it in the metro, and you actually then you have a system. That means you can pedal two kilometer go 20 kilometer by train and pedal two kilometer, then you are where you have to be without touching your car. That is why my car is standing most of the time in the carport doing nothing, because it's smarter to do it 
things in the city in other ways, and also you meet other people, it's more fun. What has happened in a city like Copenhagen, who have had this policy for now many years, a distinct public bicycle culture has developed. Everybody bicycle, it is sort of in to bicycle, businessmen bicycle, pregnant women bicycle, and children bicycle. The crown prince are bicycling. And the crown princess is bicycling even more <laughs> with, with the next king uh, on the bike next to her. I'll tell you what bicycle culture is also about. I'll tell you a little story about when my wife and I, the psychologist I told you about a little before, but when, they, when we had a 45-year anniversary, we thought it's a nice day in August, we must go, go and celebrate and have a good dinner. So we took our bicycles, and we were not quite young, we were about 70. But then we took our bicycles, and we bicycled side by side on the very good bicycle network, safely, through the crossings, and we bicycled into the old city and looked around and we went over to the harbor and we, finally we found a place to have a good celebration dinner and then we had a, a, two glasses of red wine too much but that doesn't matter when you're on bicycle you just sort of adjust your swings you can see it's a little bit more wavy and then we came back home again and then we realized that we in an age of 70 had done 20 kilometers in safety, comfort, and style through the, our, our city, um, 20 kilometers. And then we sat and talked about that in all the years we have been married, we have had this wonderful feeling that every morning when we woke up, the city was a little bit better than it was yesterday. We also realized that what we've done that day could not have been done 30 years or 40 years ago all this has happened while we had been having our family. Just to give you an idea, I put this little route over New York. You start in Central Park, you go to Battery Park, you go over in Newark, you have a dinner in the Meatpacking District, and you go back to Central Park, 20 kilometers. Copenhagen also has this 2011 a strategy, we will be the best in the world for bicycling. Do we have problems in Copenhagen? Oh yes, we have problems in Copenhagen, because now the major problem for a long time has been serious congestion on the bicycle lanes. Everybody is complaining about this awful congestion. Um, what do they do about it? Actually, they have they've worked on it for quite a while, they just double the width of the bicycle lanes. Where do they get the asphalt for, from? They take it from parking or from driving lanes. A bicycle lane can take seven ti five times more people than can a car lane. So if there's enough people who like to bicycle, it's good traffic economy to take a car lane and turn it into a bicycle lane. This is what they are doing. Also, in the, in the trains, they have had to double the capacity because it's so popular. And they have now this new policy of making all kinds of bridges for bicycles and pedestrians so that it's always more convenient and faster to take your bicycle than to take your car. That has again helped bicycling. And what has happened is we are up to 37% using bicycle every day to go to work. No, these are a couple of years old. Now we are up to 45% of everybody going, to, commuting to work and, and, and studies in the city on the bicycle lanes, which have been widened and whatever. We have seen in Denmark something interesting, that this culture, which we have actually pioneered in Copenhagen, has over the years become copied in all the provincial cities in Denmark. And much to my joy, I've seen it becoming more and more of a national policy. Who is this lady? Is that my grandmother? No, it is not. It is the Minister of Culture in Denmark. 
And she came to me and said, Jan, I was asked for you, European Union. All the cultural ministers were asked to sit in the favorite place and read the favorite book. And Jan, I took your book in English so that people can see what our cultural minister is interested in. That was a nice moment. But more important, she's the one who has changed the national architectural policy into something called putting people first. Whatever you make, architecture and city planning, put people first. What is this? Oh, this is the new Danish government arriving to the Queen to have their commission as ministers. And they arrive on bicycles. And they just went up to the, the lifeguard and said, would you look after our bicycles? We have some business with the Queen. And then that was a day when no bicycles were stolen. Um, it was very safe to have them with the guards. Are there other cities which have this sort of policy? By now, there are quite many cities who have this kind of policy. We'll do a lot for the people and a little bit less for the motor cars. One city which has done a remarkable development is the city of Melbourne. And I've decided that because of all of us being here and the oxygen is limited, I will skip fast over some of them. Melbourne, I'll skip fast over. But Melbourne is an old uh, colonial city. It was full of offices. It was completely uh, ruined by, by offices and whatever. But they've turned the city fantastically around. Melbourne now is almost as good as Paris. And the weather is quite a bit better than in Paris. So Melbourne is one of the most livable cities in the world and by far the best city in the Southern Hemisphere. It's fantastic what they've done. And all the economic factors are up. The more they do for people in Melbourne, the better for the economy. Because in the leisure time economy of the 21st century, being good to people is good economy. So if you don't know what to do, move to Melbourne. That's my advice to you. That's a nice city. I could tell you a lot about Sydney. I will not do that. We are working there. We, we are in the full speed of, of changing a lot of things, putting in light rail and taking the cars out of main streets and putting bicycles back and whatever. But what I want to sell about Sydney is that they have an interesting... Firstly, they have a strategy. They have a strategy called 2030. That means that the mayor has committed everyone that by 2030 we will have a sustainable, a healthy, a livable city. And this is what we do. And every year they go towards this goal. And everybody, whenever one say, you are taking my car, parks, uh, car parking away, they say, no, that's only before 2030. It's not tomorrow, it's maybe next year. So having a strategy and a direction is a very good thing for a city. So Sydney is going green and everybody knows it. And Sydney has been a bit slow in doing physical changes, but they are very, very good in making posters about where they want to go. So the city is full of posters saying, we will do something for walking and bicycle. We will do something for the climate. We are doing all this, and, and this is part of this major plan to go there from where we are. The mayor has just been re-elected for the first time with a landslide vote because she really has the population behind her, and she tells everybody very carefully about why they do it and what they do, and they are really on the track to be a, a green and people-oriented city. I could tell you about New York. Of course, there's no time for that. I could tell you much about This is a guy called um, Michael Bloomberg. He was mayor for actually 12 years, and he had this plan to make New York the most sustainable metropole in the world. He had this other plan that you should not commute into Manhattan. You should take the train or you should bicycle. 
He said it's a perfect city for bicycling. The streets are wide and the terrain is flat and the houses are well concentrated. So you take my metro or you take your bike. He put in 800 kilometers of bicycle lanes and they did everything to promote bicycling. And also they started to think about that in New York you can walk and walk and walk, but you could never sit. There were no benches, there were no sidewalk cafes, so you could just walk and walk. And if you got tired, you could go four kilometers down to Central Park and sit. But then they said, couldn't we have in New York wonderful spa spaces like they have in Rome and in Paris and in, in European cities? And then we started to, to look a bit closer on Broadway and then we found out that actually the traffic didn't use they didn't need Broadway. They could do without Broadway. And then we managed to make a case for closing Broadway. Not the whole of Broadway, but every time there was a square or possibility to make a public space, it was closed. One of the places being Times Square. This is Times Square in 2009, in the spring. This is Times Square a little bit later in the year. And the moment the cars came out, the people came jumping in, in great numbers. Now they have 150,000 people coming every day. And now they've got so happy about this that they made 50 other public spaces, all of them taken from the traffic and given to the people who have come out in great numbers to enjoy. They've been so happy about turning these traffic traps into recreation that they, the New Yorker had a front piece here where they brought in the prairies and the bisons and have some home on the range on Times Square. Have a nice time in New York. They heard about New York in Moscow. And uh, I was giving a lecture like this one in Montreal and then this man came galloping up and said, Hey, I'm a deputy mayor from Moscow. We need you over in Moscow. We would like to humanize Moscow. We, we have one year. <laughs> and, and he said, When can you come? Monday. I can come on Monday. Yes, let's do that. So we were invited to come to Moscow. In the beginning, I was completely shocked because I've never seen a city who was so much invaded by so many cars. It was like as if freedom from communism is the right to park everywhere. And this is a nice little street in Moscow. And this is a nice little pedestrian crossing in Moscow, 2012. Then in Moscow, they are very quick. So they said, how many books have you written, Jan? We'll translate them all. <laughs> and then I gave them some of the books. And then in three months' time, they were published in Russian by the city of Moscow. And here is the mayor and, and some other guys. And the guy who's a little bit worried, that's the Danish ambassador. Then we were hired or we were commissioned to do a study of public life in, in Moscow. And that was very easy because the car parking and the cars have almost killed all activity. So there were hardly very few people on the streets because the streets were full of cars. Uh, but we studied this and in the process, one of the things was that on Main Street, Moscow, the sidewalks, because they haven't got enough parking. So they took the sidewalks on Main Street, Moscow, Tverskaya, was turned into parking for cars, leaving one meter for people to still use the Main Street. So I said, I was invited up to the mayor, Sobyanin, and he said, what will be in your report? Yeah, this idea of parking on Main Street, I think that is not a good idea. I will mention it in my report. 
And then two months later, I was back in Moscow. There was no car parking on the sidewalks or Main Street anymore. They were gone. They're very efficient <laughs> when they want to, to move over there. And then if you think that the Russians will forget the new rule, the mayor had a number of these cars which goes around and picks up your car, bring it to Siberia, where you don't know if you'll get it back. <laughs> Very efficient. But, but just one and a half year after we started in Moscow, I was back, uh, we've been back a number of times, but then there had been happening miracles I've never seen anything like it. This is Main Street, Moscow, Tverskaya. The old days with the parked cars and the one meter for the pedestrians. Now, all the cars are gone. There are benches all the way. The gray street has become green. And all the advertisements have come down. So you have the, vis the view in the street to Kremlin in the distance. It's a miracle. And e and they have even been able to take off their overcoats because of all the improvements. But it's a miracle that these things can happen. And actually, in Moscow, they've gone on and on with these improvements. The city was completely inundated with motor cars, and they have addressed a number of streets and have done many things, and many of the pedestrian crossings which were completely ruined. They have cleared it up. They have, actually they have made now a parking system and they are sure that it works. They have also started to put in bicycle lanes citywide. They still have the few guys offending, but they still have the mayor's car who take you to Siberia. So uh, I was so, I was there in the spring this year I was, it was 2016, I was so surprised of how much of a difference it has made to this city in just four years. And also there was this monument of Corbusier, and I had to go over and tell him that all this about modernism actually, you know, there was something which went wrong here, and so, and he listened carefully, that's good. So now we have a situation where even the mayor of Moscow goes around the world and tells about the importance of having a livable city. And the mayor of Vilnius, he goes around and tells people not to park in his bike lanes. So we have a new situation. Things are changing. Even in, in Bucharest, in, in Romania, they have not really sorted out the problems yet, but they have my book, so very shortly I'm sure <laughs> that they will have cleaned up uh, Bucharest. End of story, but I have a little extra story. comes here. The livability test. This is Mrs. Lan. She's employed in the Danish embassy in Vietnam in Hanoi. And I was out there to publish a book in Vietnamese. And then I met Mrs. Lan. She has just been in Copenhagen for a conference in the foreign ministry. And she said, oh, she kept saying to me and my wife, you must have a baby boom in Copenhagen. I, I went to Copenhagen. It was absolutely, you, you must have a baby boom. And, and, and we could say, baby boom? No, no, not at all. We have a reproduction problem. There will be none, no Danish people back there uh, in 200 years, so we have no baby boom, unfortunately. But then I realized what she had experienced. That was a city where you saw a lot of children. And then I realized that when going around Copenhagen, you see a lot of children. You see that all these prams being dragged around by mothers and fathers. You see the kindergartens going on the sidewalks next to the bicycles. You see that one third of all the families have a cargo bike and it's full of kids. And this is my grandchildren, some of them. Um, and so you see a lot of kids and every time you see a bicycle, there will be one, two, and sometimes three children hanging on the bicycle. And when the children 
are, two, are four years old, they all of them learn to bicycle, and that is very important. These are again my grandchildren, but they are very concentrated, and it's very important for a four-year-old to be able to bike. And my daughters tell me that when they can bike, you can take them out in the traffic when they are five years old, and then you see the children. In the kindergarten, they learn to bicycle, and when they are four years or five years old, you can take them all over the city if they are accompanied. And when they are 10 years old, they can go by themselves, which again, some of my grandchildren comes eight kilometers to visit grandpa and grandma on their bike on their own, 10 years old. I think that's a very nice city when these things can happen. This is a Copenhagen lullaby. Soon he will be asleep. And so then comes my reflection here. If you see a city with many children present in the city, or many old people present in the city, it's a sure sign of quality and livability. So go out and watch for the children in your city. That's a good sign of whether you have made some quality. And with this, I'll say welcome to the 21st century. And good luck to Prague and your excellent Institute of City Planning to all the work you have planned and are in the process of doing. I will follow it closely. And I should end here, but I have one more slide I just made today, which was shocking for me. I got a message from Copenhagen that in Copenhagen, for every thousand inhabitants, we have 193 cars. And then I got the information from Prague that for every thousand, you have 536 cars. That is two and a half times more than we have. But also, you have much shorter time to collect all these cars. I think this is a good challenge, and I look forward to working with the city of Prague and wish you all good luck with making a livable city. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Jan Gell. Thank you very much. Now, I'd like to invite to the stage the Deputy Mayor, Mr. Dolinek. Thank you very much. Dobrý podvečer. Já jsem velmi nadšeně vyslechl tady přednášku, spíš exkurs pana Gela o tom, jak se dá v Praze a ve světě dělat doprava. A musím říct, já jsem s paní Náměstský Kolínskou zažil poslední dva měsíce takový neuvěřitelný příběh. On je asi velmi důležitý pro tu přednášku. My jsme přišli na radu města s tím, že uh, už naše, naše děti, moje děti, mají tři roky a jezdí na kole ve třech letech, moje dcera. Takže k tomu příběhu ještě o rok, když se jezdí na kole. A zažili jsme to, že jsme řekli, že naše děti by nemuseli znát pojem magistrála. Mohli by znát pojem městský bulvár. A ne všichni ve vedení města se na tom sjednotili, ne všichni byli připraveni říct, ano, magistrála je minulostí, městský bulvár je budoucnost města. A uh, my jsme navrhli, že umíme technicistně vyřešit, jak magistrála může mít ne méně pruhů, ale nějak řešené pruhy, nějak řešenou dopravu. A to se nesetkalo s dobrou odezvou. A proto jsem rád, že máme zde někoho, s kým zítra Rada hlavního města Prahy bude jednat, koho bude Rada oslovat zítra a s kým se budeme snažit bavit o tom, jak proměnit veřejný prostor, kdo může dát tu nadstavbu. Nejenom to, že tam se dá ovlivnit vlastně průjeznost aut a omezit to jako celek. A kdo skutečně má zkušenost ze světa a kdo nám může poradit, jak tomu dát to navíc, aby to Pražany bavilo, aby to mělo smysl a zároveň, aby to fungovalo. Takže děkuji za tuto přednášku a děkuji za to, že máme šanci vám představit a že vám pan Archiv představil tu šanci, jak se dá upravit veřejný prostor a přitom zachovat funkční město. Díky za to. Děkuji. Děkuji.
So now we have time to open the floor to some questions. So is there anyone who wants to go first? There should be some people walking around with microphones. So or maybe I start with a question. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you ended your presentation with an image of Prague or a statistic of Prague. I know you've been here several times and today you also had a tour of Prague a little bit. So my question is quite simple. Could you give us a specific example maybe of a pos positive public space where you said, wow, that is a good street, square or park. And, and again, what else should we focus on? What were some of the places that didn't live up to your standards? I'm, I'm not a strong believer in having firm opinions after 24 hours in a city. I've been here a number of times, but that would mostly have been as a tourist, and I haven't really had time to look carefully into a number of issues. Um, so I will tell you an answer to your question next time when I come, when I've had time to study it a bit more carefully. And also my, my team has been had time to go a little bit more into depth. I look forward to answering your question. <laughs> so do we have any questions from the audience? Thank you, Mr. Gaff, for uh, your presentation. Um, one of the uh, most common arguments I can hear about uh, like having less cars in Prague is that uh, example of Copenhagen or Melbourne can't be followed that much because uh, Copenhagen or Melbourne are quite flat cities, uh, but Prague is a little bit hilly. So uh, do you have any example of city where can we, whether someone in the world, uh, can people bike as much as, as in Copenhagen and uh, the city has the hillier landscape? I think, I think it's, <clears throat> it's important that it's not about bicycling or not bicycling. I just sh uh, tell, told you about the city of Copenhagen, what they have done because of their history and their topography, their climate. And in different cities, it could be different solutions to making a livable city. Um, the question you are taking up here about bicycling in a, in a slightly topographical city. I think that in many cities we can see now that the el 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 electro bikes are, are used very much in overcoming some of this hilliness. So I've seen examples that, that uh, things are changing because of the technology. And also if you have better gears and the bicycles and a few other things. I know of many one of the strongest bicycle associations I know is San Francisco, where I didn't expect to have any bicycles, but there are a lot. But they know exactly where they can prevent the hills and go around in their own way. So, never say never. But it's important for me that it's not about bicycling, this thing. Actually, I'm much, always more interested in people uh, but I use these various, I tell what the traffic policy are in these various cities. And that's why I tell about the bicycles. Thank you, Jan. Excellent talk. Um. Okay, excellent talk. Um, right here. The question for you is, um, where a day when probably 80% of people are walking around with uh, smartphones? Um, is there any cities you know of that are using technology like this to um, track the flow of people and better plan their cities using technology and building cities for technology like smart cities? Um, is this going on? Do you know anywhere that's doing it? Um, have you seen the examples? Yeah, actually... If you go into the internet and look, take a look at the city of Melbourne, they have live supervision of all the major streets and they show from hour or minute to minute how many people are there and what they are doing. Not in a, in a snoopy way, but in a sort of 
so you can get a feeling of what's happening in the city today. So certainly this new technology is used in, in a number of places. But we shall be aware that all these, sometimes I see places and cities that they be carried away with all the smart gimmicks. And I think that much of the stuff I'm telling about is, is down-to-earth, non-rocket science about homo sapiens moving about and being happy in his uh, human environment, not about being too smart. Další dotaz byl ve stejné řadě kolega vedle. Tam se někdo hlásil, stejná řada to byla, tuším. Odešel, tak někdo další? Uh, I would like, to, uh, maybe it's a question more for the, uh, for the uh, IPR and the municipality, but what will be Jan Gell's task? Is it only magistrala? change to Boulevard, which is very sexy, but we have terrible problems in all of the city. And yeah, thank you. Is somebody asking it? What is your, what was your task for Prague? Maybe, or maybe I would say that to me, it's not so important if it's that street or that square or that park. But to me, it's always about that we have to change the way we think of cities so that we have to change the mindsets and then we can change the cities. And the mindset change is something about informing what other cities have done and what kind of knowledge we have today. And in this way, in, say, in Copenhagen, they say that in Copenhagen, all the politicians and all the planners, they have changed the mindset of themselves, so they think of city planning in another way as they did 25 years ago. So it's something about changing the way you look at cities and what problems you solve, and not about a specific street or specific um, area. Děkujeme. Tak máme čas ještě na jednu poslední otázku. One last question. I see you right there. Sorry, I have, I have the microphone already. Okay, then two questions, I guess. <laughs> Where are you? Uh, good evening, Mr. Kell. I was also very pleased by your presentation. I'm here on the left. I have a very specific question regarding Prague, which is known to be a very historical city. In my opinion, sometimes it switches to a museum of itself. Um, we go from one extreme to another. We cancel car traffic in the street and then we also forbade the cyclists to go there completely. In the historical cities, um, like Prague, there are cobblestone streets, which are sometimes very dangerous. I myself have an experience of falling from a bicycle two weeks ago and it still hurts. And I would like to know your opinion how to combine um, preserving the historical center of a city like Prague and the modern approach to making the traffic, especially in bicycles, more safe and more convenient for the users. There is a general pattern, actually worldwide, that bicycling is really on its way up. I think that only last year I was at a big meeting with the, all the traffic ministers from European Union where they decided for a, a common bicycle policy that they should do whatever they could to shift as much as they could over to bicycle and do more for bicycling in the European cities because it would be good for pollution, it would be good for the climate, it would be good for health and good for livability and also for noise and also the bicycling is cheap or whatever. So there is worldwide a movement really strong towards having more bicycles in the cities. I was so surprised myself to see that they've done it, they bloody well done it in Moscow. That was the last place I would think about it. And I never mentioned bicycle in Moscow. They just came up with all this by themselves. But it is a smart way in the 21st century 
to exercise and get around. So the European Union cities are actually pushing for better planning for that mode of transportation. And we have excellent examples from Denmark and from Holland about how to do it uh, smart. Smart. Yes. Thank you. And now the very, very last question from the lady over here. Uh, hi, I think your presentation was uh, really well, well done. Uh, I'm from India and I think we have a slightly different uh, issue at hand. Uh, even if somebody proposes a bicycle lane or a public square, it doesn't get executed because of the planning committees and because of the corruption in the government. So I, I really hope, I mean, my, I don't really have a question. It's just, a, it's more of a comment and appreciation for what you do. Um, and I wish that someday that my country too can, um, you know, follow these uh, paths. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> do, you do you speak Marathi? No, no. <laughs> I don't, but I understand, I understand it. Because I do have a book in Marathi. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that could... I, I noticed on the map. <laughs> um, I only talked about the, the western city which have been invaded by motor cars and some have done something and some have done something else and some have done not so much. Um, but really... Also, this kind of thinking, which is about um, people, about planning for pedestrians, planning for bicycles, as this case, which is the cheapest you can do in a city. And I know that it is, I think that the place where it is most necessary to be ready to do this people oriented planning would be in all the fast growing cities in the developing world. I know that in cities in South America, they have started to say that let's go for these cheap investments in infrastructure to make the poor people more mobile so they can get around in the city in a better way instead of doing the investments for the 20% who go in cars, we shall do the investment for the 80% who have no cars. And I think that's a very good way and uh, it's very inspiring. And I really think that this humanistic thinking would be even more well used in the developing countries. Thank you very much. That's all the time that we had today for the questions. This was Mr. Yangel.